Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is a naval view of the Asia Pacific, and our guest is U.S. Navy retired Captain James Kimo Fennell, editor in chief of Red Star Rising, a new service, and government fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Welcome to Asian Review. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Great. Well, uh, let's see. You know, the Shangri-La Conference just concluded in Singapore, and that's a big annual event. And we want to talk a little bit about that. But for the benefit of our audience members who might not be familiar with the Shangri-La Conference, can you give them just a brief explanation? Yes. Uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue is hosted by uh, a think tank, uh, IISS, out of, uh, I think, believe, uh, uh, London and England. Uh, but it's really hosted, co-hosted by the government of Singapore. And it brings in defense chiefs from around the Asia-Pacific region uh, to discuss uh, items and concerns in the defense uh, of the region. And so it's an annual uh, event. Uh, and as you know, our Secretary of Defense was just there and gave a very uh, uh, interesting speech that's got a lot of reaction from Beijing. Well, we want to talk a little bit about that because uh, his speech did get people's attention in Beijing. It made some pretty, what the Chinese would consider provocative comments about China. But uh, what's your take on the speech? Uh, I think that it was a, a, a solid speech uh, uh, by a Secretary of Defense who doesn't have a lot of uh, time in the region, but has shown initially, in, in, right coming into the job, that he was going to make Asia a top priority uh, for himself and for the new administration. Uh, and he you know, focused on uh, two areas, uh, key security challenges, and he mentioned North Korea, China, and then at the very end, uh, some comments about uh, global terrorism. And then he talked about the U.S. strategy and approach to how we would, as a nation, address those challenges in the region. His comments about Taiwan really sort of stuck out to me, especially since I just came back after spending a, a year in Taiwan. And he, he made some a pretty, he took a pretty hard stand on defending Taiwan, didn't he? Yeah, he, he mentioned the Taiwan Relations Act and that we were uh, kind of legally bound to uh, follow, follow that, uh, you know, guidance that, that's placed on uh, each administration by the Congress. And uh, typically, uh, our, uh, at least in the last few years, our Secretary of Defense haven't articulated that uh, in the forum. But I think uh, uh, his articulating that got China's ire. Uh, and so they've been sounding off today, the day after the conference closed, and many of their uh, press publications have, uh, and their foreign ministry spokesmen making rather sharp comments. Mm, Beijing is not happy. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, um, you know, now we, we're talking about, you know, U.S. policy in Asia. But it always seems the pull is between the Middle East in Asia, mm -hmm. and as much as the U.S. has said, well, you know, the economies of the future and the wealth of the future is to be made in Asia, we still can't seem to extricate ourselves from the Middle East. So maybe this is an unfair question to ask you since you're an Asia-Pacific guy, but if one steps back and takes a look at both, what's the relative importance of the Middle East versus Asia-Pacific? Well, I think both are important. Uh, we are a two ocean navy, okay. or nation and navy, and okay. uh, so we we have interests, strategic interests in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have strategic interests in Asia, and Europe's strategic interests uh, and ours in terms of uh, access to resources, uh, energy resources, come from the Middle East. Uh, additionally, now over the last uh, two or three decades, we've had strategic interests as we fight global terrorism. Uh, and so there's certainly areas there that we just can't ignore and walk away from. And so the question becomes, what do you do with the resources that you have, and how do you uh, allocate them to the two different regions that are strategically important to the nation? Mm. And that's been a challenge, and predominantly uh, or over the last 30 years, you could say that we've given a lot more attention uh, to the CENTCOM or Middle Eastern uh, region than we have maybe to the Pacific in terms of uh, allocation of resources. However, you know, Secretary of Defense Mattis went through a litany of uh, list of resources that have been applied to the Pacific, suggesting that we are now uh, putting more attention into the Pacific. I think this is the real question of what have we really put out here, and is it really having the effect that the Secretary said that we want to have, which is to deter unilateral aggressive action? And 
the non-peaceful resolution of disputes, which is what we see China not always doing. Hmm, interesting comment. Uh, you know, Kirk Camel's book, Pivot, um, I read it, finished reading a couple of months ago, and um, he makes a point throughout his book that Asia is always kind of an afterthought to the U.S. Uh, it talks big on Asia, but in reality, it's sort of a secondary interest. Do you buy into that? I think as I went through the Secretary's speech and some of the things that he said, he talked about that the U.S. was in favor of a rules-based uh, uh, order, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the peaceful resolution of disputes, and he talked and said all the right things. But at the end of the speech, I was left wondering, so how do we implement these things? For instance, he referenced the July 2016 arbitration tribunal ruling Right. on the case that the Philippines brought against China's excessive claims in the South China Sea. Right. And he mentioned that ruling. That's a good thing. Uh, he said it was a binding ruling. Well, how is it binding? Under what pretext is that binding on China? How has China stopped That's a good point. anything that they've done in the South China Sea? And so I think we're at a critical point in time where we say the right things, but is it really having the deterrent effect to change China's behavior? And frankly, the answer is no. I, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I think it can be said that China's goal is pretty clear cut. It wants the U.S. out of Asia. It wants to rule the roost without any interference whatsoever. Would you buy into that? Uh, they, from a military standpoint, I think it's very clear that China wants to drive the U.S. military out of the Asia-Pacific region. I don't believe they want to do it in all one fail swoop. I think they have a plan, uh, the salami slicing, if you will. Uh, they go after things incrementally. Uh, but their, the, their reaction, for instance, to the THAAD uh, uh, terminal high-altitude uh, aerial defense network or battery that was put into South Korea, their rea reaction and response to a defensive weapons system has been clearly over the top, not just in their rhetoric, but in the way they've treated uh, the South Koreans. Right, right. I mean, not just, uh, you know, diplomatic, you know, uh, pushback, but there's also been economic penalties that have been placed on the South Koreans, our ally. And so uh, China is not happy about having U.S. military presence in the region, and so they're trying to do everything they can to drive us away. That, that's really interesting when you're talking about South Korea because uh, South Korea has really, you know, put a lot of energy into developing its relationship with China, becoming very friendly, and uh, to some degree, maybe upsetting a few people in Washington, too. Yeah, you know, this thing can only go so far. And uh, China has really pushed back and um, overreacted, perhaps. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's going to be curious to me to see what happens. Is that going to stay, or is it going to go, or, or what? And, then, and then on the other hand, then the Koreans always say, well, uh, you know, you guys might pack it up and go home and leave us hanging, as I think every Asian country does at one time or another. Yet, we have the fad there. Um, we, we have all kinds of exercises with the uh, South Koreans throughout the year. And there's always a sort of, um, well, are you guys going to really stay or not? Uh, and so I'm, I'm and, and at the same time, they try to develop their relationship with China um, very closely. So I, I know it's going to be really interesting to see how it evolves, I think. Well, uh, as, 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 again, I, I think the Secretary of Defense is a very smart person and a very studied person on uh, world history. and and uh, strategic issues. And he talks frequently about that nations that have alliances and partners usually thrive, and those that don't usually wither. And so I, I, he's right, that's what history teaches us. And that's why you need to look at the long term, the last 15 years, and watch China try to disassemble um, the, the structure of American alliances in the post-World War II environment. Look at the relationship with Philippines. Look at what's going on in Thailand. Look at some of the issues and the stresses that are in South Korea right now. Right. Capital after capital after capital across Asia is questioning, and India as well, whether or not the United States is really committed and is going to back up their words with real actions. And unfortunately, they can look at and see seven new 
artificial islands in the South China Sea that we didn't do anything about. Right. We can see in 2012 that China gobbled up and took Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines without a without a sh firing a shot, and the United States sat back and did nothing. I, well, you know, I was going to go there a little bit later, but since you put your finger on it earlier, uh, right now, actually, um, wh what do you think the U.S. should have done with Scarborough Shoal? When this went down uh, in, in April of 2012, when the Philippine Navy ship Gregorio, Gregorio del Pilar, which was an ex-U.S. Uh, Coast Guard cutter, Hamilton class, was uh, sold to the Philippine government, refurbished by the Philippines, and, and, and brought into the Philippine Navy. On its first deployment in April of 2012, uh, it was returning from the South China Sea, and it was heading back to Manila, and it got word that the Chinese fishing fleet was, or not fishing fleet, but Chinese uh, fishing fleet and other vessels were in and around Scarborough, which is 140 miles west of Manila. It's 400 miles from mainland China. It's clearly in the exclusive economic zone of the Republic of the Philippines. Philippines is a part or treaty partner with the United States. And when the Chinese moved in there, uh, we, we didn't really say anything. And for five months after that happened in the middle of April, the U.S. government, neither our state Department, the Secretary of State, neither our Secretary of Defense or our President made any kind of statement publicly that said Article 5 of our Mutual Defense Treaty should be invoked because China is now usurping and taking uh, territory from our treaty ally. And instead, the man you just mentioned, Kurt Campbell, conducted, you know, behind the door negotiations with. Fu Ying, uh, their, their uh, foreign ministry person, mm -hmm. and from the Philippines, and came up with a, some kind of a tacit agreement that uh, everybody would leave in the middle of June, June 16th, I believe, of 2012. And when that happened, uh, the Filipinos dutifully left the shoal and the Chinese stayed. And they have maintained sovereign control over Scarborough Shoal for f over five years now. And we did not do or say anything. What could have we done? Well, from the day that they started threatening the Philippines in April, we should have deployed combatants down there and came within uh, 12 nautical miles of that shoal. We had the coordination with the Philippine government. It could have, they could have supported it easily. And we should have put a military show of force in there, but we didn't. And worse is we didn't say anything internationally for five months, and it really destroyed America's credibility. Or, didn't destroy it. It, it. it severely damaged our credibility amongst Asian leaders. Well, we've looked into much uh, either about the fortification of those islands in the South China Sea. There was a lot of talk, um, but no action. And is that um, to be blamed on uh, the Obama administration's caution? I, I, I don't think it's the where the way we deal with China isn't specifically. I don't think with a specific administration, uh, especially given now what we've seen with the invitation of China for RIMPAC 2018. Right. This is a 40-year issue, but since we opened up relations with China in the Carter administration, we have had successive presidents from each party basically say to China the relationship is something that we care deeply about and we don't want it disrupted. And so we will figure out ways to rationalize, accommodate, and even appease China to ensure that we don't upset them. And we have walked slowly back on other alliances and friendships and partnerships. You can talk about Taiwan, you can talk about the Philippines, you can talk about Thailand, and you see the erosion of our alliance structure. Now, we put a good smiley face on it at places like Shangri-La, uh, but we need to be honest to ourselves and have straight talk inside the U.S. government, which is to say, what are we really going to do when our allies don't trust us? Good point. I think we're going to stop here and take a break. Uh, you're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is uh, U.S. Navy retired Captain Jim uh, Kimo Fennell, and we're talking about U.S. Uh, uh, well, naval power in Asia. And we'll be right back. Landing all week for the day of the big day. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. Put on the list, it's who's gonna drive. It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DC. 
For every game day, assign a designated driver. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come laying on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can touch a flag though banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself to you can find yourself. Stand in the hall of fame. Yeah. 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 Welcome back to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our guest today is uh, U.S. Navy retired, um, Captain uh, James Kimo Fanel. We've been talking about um, uh, naval power in the Asia Pacific. Uh, our guest is extremely conversant with a variety of issues, so we're really glad to have him here with us. Uh, and he came all the way from Switzerland just to join us for this show. Well, not really, but we like to say that anyway. Um, okay, well, just before the break, we were talking about RIMPAC, and it's always controversial, I suppose we could say, will China participate or not? And this year, again, it looks like China's going to participate. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, I've been a vocal proponent, or a, a, a vocally opposed to China participating in RIMPAC, uh, given their be bad behavior in the region. And so uh, it was a little bit shocking to me to see the administration uh, invite them again uh, without a serious dialogue uh, when we were kind of expe expecting that this new administration would take a kind of a zero-based review approach of some of the things that have been sacrosanct over the years. And the president started in 2012 with an invitation, although the Chinese didn't attend. Uh, they were invited in 2012. They were invited in 14 and participated and sent an, an intelligence collection ship to the region to... I remember that, yeah. right. They also sent one in 2012 that people don't talk too much about, but there was a Chinese intelligence ship that collected on RIMPAC in 2012. Uh, and then they were invited and participated in 16. And so I kind of use the analogy of if you had a, a, a neighborhood where someone was robbing people and you knew who they were, and they were coming into people's houses and robbing in your house, and robbing you on a routine basis, would you invite that same robber to your annual Easter dinner at your own home? And it appears that that's what we seem to be doing, is we keep inviting China to our big Easter spread or Christmas, whatever date you want to use on it, but we keep inviting them to a party, expecting that they'll stop their behavior of, of, of thievery and, and robbery in the region. Uh, we don't do that for real robbers. Uh, we don't do that with other countries like North Korea or Iran or other uh, bad actors, so I'm not sure why we take this approach with China, which gets back to this 40-year-old view uh, that's come from the essentially the establishment of relations that said, keep the relationship, don't let the relationship uh, be abused. And so because of that belief system, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, uh, that has overridden, I think, some of our normal common sense and how we approach people that act, act, act poorly. Mm. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Well, some people say that really Taiwan should be involved in RIMPAC. And of course, I think it's, um, how should you say, totally unrealistic to expect that China would expect that, would, would participate if Taiwan were participating. But we do have a number of exercises sort of away from the cameras with Taiwan, don't we? We, uh, we have uh, people that visit and participate in certain exercises, like the Hong Kong series in, mm -hmm, in, in mm -hmm. Taiwan. I've, mm -hmm. I've participated in those and been an observer of uh, several Hong Kong exercises. So there is some of that, and it is not unprecedented. And we have the Taiwan Relations Act, and I think one could easily make the logical argument that we, if we want to have better coordination uh, with the Taiwan military, they now have P3s, and right. so we have all have mutual interest in understanding the maritime domain, uh, what's going on, where are where our ships and submarines and aircraft in the Asia Pacific region, uh, and that Taiwan has uh, you know maritime patrol assets now. Sharing that information seemed to be a kind of a logical uh, uh, 
interoperability that we'd want to pursue, and Brimpac would seem to be a nice place to do that. that that's a key word, isn't it? And interoperability. Right. Um, you know, the Hong Guang, uh, I've always been quite interested in the Hong Guang, and I, I read a comment the other day, and I guess it was um, not Defense News, but Shepherd News, I guess it was. Right. And um, the person that wrote that was suggesting that Hong Guang was fairly staged. This was all show for President Tsai. Yeah, I, I it looks like you it. read that as well. Yeah. Uh, so when you observed Hong Guang, did you um, get the feeling it was staged? No. I, I mean, there's exercises by definition are scripted. You know, there's um, uh, scenario events that you want to, uh, training events and evolutions that you want to achieve. So if you want to be able to do air defense, then you have to have air defense batteries practice certain procedures. If you want to have fighters be able to provide combat air patrol, the fighters have to do that. There's certain things that have to be uh, scheduled and certain times of the exercise that they have to be accomplished. So that's not foreign to Taiwan. All militaries do that, including the U.S. So my view of this was a little bit different that I don't think it's, it's not on par with the U.S. in some sense. It's not mm -hmm. maybe as freewheeling as that we are, but we've been, we're, we're a different uh, kind of a military, right. different experience and right. much, uh, much more uh, innovative in our approach to things and, and freewheeling. I think the Taiwans, though, over the time that I've been watching them, have more and more adopted those kind of approaches. I'm sure there are certain elements uh, in Taiwan that you could characterize as being scripted and stilted and not really war fighting, uh, uh, ben benefiting war fighting uh, training and readiness. But I think the trend line of where Taiwan's going is in a positive direction. But they need assistance and help from the United States, I, I believe. Mm. You know, um, I, What's troubled me a little bit about the Hong Kong is some, a few years they had no live fire at all, and uh, they depended very heavily on computer simulations. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but um, I sort of think the real thing is more useful. So let's talk, let's talk about that. I mean, okay. It's not just Taiwan that does computer, computer simulation. Mm -hmm. The United States military today does more com computer simulation and training than, uh, than we did when I joined the Navy 30 years Is ago. Is that right? Oh, definitely. And I, I, I can't go into details, but I can just tell you this, that the Chinese fire more live fire weapons than any other nation in the Asia Pacific region and probably in the world when it comes to things like ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. So uh, they uh, appreciate your sentiments and, and our experience that there's nothing like doing the real thing uh, to, to be really trained and ready. Mm, interesting, really interesting. Well, um, the big talk in the town is the one belt, one road. And uh, some people say, well, this is China's attempt at globalization. This is China's approach to globalization. Uh, and some people suggest it's going to have a dynamic effect on the um, complexion of world power. And I wonder what your take is. Well, I think there's, I think the initiative clearly is uh, China said that they want to change from the the Washington Consensus to a Beijing Consensus. Right. They want to change the post-World War II order of international norms. In fact, the responses to the Secretary of Defense's speech mentioned the fact that, you know, the U.S. imposed this kind of order, and we're going to we're going to rethink how that is done, and we are going to do it through one belt, one road. Uh, President Xi Jinping gave a speech in Davos, Switzerland, this mm -hmm. uh, this winter in January, and talked about. China's commitment to globalized economy. And so, uh, yes, what you said is they're expanding to an area of the world that hasn't previously been touched by the global community, which is South Asia and the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East and connecting those uh, through the old Silk Roads, if you will. Uh, there are many uh, skeptics of this, uh, whether or not this will be successful uh, because of the money uh, where the money's going to come from, will the investments that China makes, the loans that they give, will they be repaid, or will they all come up uh, short? Well, we're getting down to our last three minutes. Um, I, I often wonder about the One Belt, One Road. This is going to go through lots of parts of Central Asia, which was part of the so-called Russian Empire. I can't imagine the Russians are too happy about this, although on the other hand, they want to 
pretend as though they're buddy buddy with China. What's your take on that? China Russian relations right now are, you know, for the last uh, probably decade have been on a very good, good, good terms. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Sure. These annual exercises the Chinese and that the Russians have in Asia and in the Mediterranean. And so I think, in one sense, the Chinese uh, are, are using Russia uh, to help combat against America. Right. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, the Russians will not, will they, they'll be skeptics if China gets too big. And so, uh, you know, Westphalian uh, politics, uh, balances of power, some would suggest that we need to just uh, keep moving along to see if there's going to be a balancing out between China and Russia. I'm not so, I'm not so sure right now. I, I, I remember, I think it was two years ago, I had a pretty interesting discussion in Beijing with a, a Beijing University professor yeah. of international relations, and he was calling the Russian-Chinese uh, relationship uh, Biaomian. In other words, it just exists kind of on the surface. There's right. no deep substance to it. And I, I think in the last couple of years it's taken on some substance, but I still think it's a very shaky show. I'm just waiting for the day when China says, you know, the Russian Far East, that's really our turf. We want it back. I'm just waiting for that day. I'm just waiting to see how the Russians handle that and what, how that wonderful relationship is going to adjust to that. Right. <laughs> that would upset the apple cart for sure. Uh, that certainly would. Well, um, South China Sea, we, this is so unfair, but the clock is yeah. not our friend usually, and again, today it's not. We need to talk just a bit about the South China Sea. Um, all kinds of talk about a code of, contact, a code of conduct evolving. But it's, if I miss, unless I miss something, the U.S. Uh, still hasn't signed the Law of the Sea Convention. And isn't it about time? I think uh, every uh, chief of naval operations that I can remember in my lifetime uh, has recommended to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman that you know it should be signed. So from the U.S. Navy's pr position, it's something that should be signed so that we don't have to take uh, pushback from China when we're having these kinds of discussions and negotiations about international law, and the first thing the Chinese say is you haven't signed that. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a you know a law of the sea expert. So there may be issues still that some people are concerned about uh, U.S. sovereignty. Right. Uh, but what I would say is that the United States is a you know we we practice and follow the the law of the sea co uh, convention and its customary law, and so we shouldn't feel uh, embarrassed or take a back seat to China when they say we haven't signed it. We actually did sign it as a country, but it just wasn't ratified. It wasn't by the ratified, Senate. right. So, and, and we helped write a lot of it. So I don't think that it's something that we should, you know, obsess on. Recall, China worked a declaration of a code of conduct with the ASEAN nations in 2002, and then proceeded over the next 14 years to violate every element of that convention. That's what some people say. The U.S. didn't sign the law of the sea, but it follows it. China signed it, but doesn't follow it. That's it. Wow. Well, I think that uh, about brings us down to the end of our time, unfortunately. We could go on and on and on. Um, we're going to have to stop here. So thank you for joining us, and thank you to our guest for uh, sharing his views with us today. My guest next week will be Mr. Unik Wu, uh, joining us via Skype from uh, Taiwan. Um, he is a very strong advocate of reinstituting the draft in Taiwan. and. Uh, Having served in the Taiwan military uh, and um, advocating the return of conscription, uh, I'm sure you will enjoy his uh, views. So follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn just by typing my name, Bill Sharp, and we'll see you next week.